Beautiful. Lachlan Marenta, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. Thank you for giving me your time, buddy. It's all right. Keeps me away from work for a couple of minutes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way, mate. Um, yeah, I won't keep too much of your time, mate. Um, just talk about a bit of your career and um, yeah, stuff that you're up to these days. And um, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so we'll start off. You um, played 72 games for the Broncos. Um, played a couple of games for St. George and you also played uh, for the Queensland Reds in the rugby union, mate. Um, when you look back at your career, is there anything you've taken out of it that's uh, turned you into the man that you are today? Um, oh, yeah, obviously, footy gives you life lessons throughout every stage of your career. Um, I think probably at a, at a younger age or when I was finishing up, I'd, you know, you look back on your career and go, oh, I should have done that differently. I should have done this differently. If I'd done that, this would have happened. But I think you know, since leaving for you, I'm a firm believer in what's happened. Um, sort of leads you to where you are today. And the life I have now is from those decisions. And I wouldn't change the life that I have now. So I, I hold no regrets in my career. Um, you don't know what you don't know. So what's going on now is, is a result of my career. So it's been a um, pretty smooth transition into the sort of corporate world since leaving footy. Um, and again, something that I didn't appreciate was probably the links between the corporate world and being in, in a footy team and, and the work ethic that you need in a corporate world, that the skills can translate over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's beautiful, mate. You know, you've been able to make that transition over to the corporate world and I guess being young and um, a lot of players these days don't sort of make that connection as, as you said you didn't as either the corporate world and the, the professional rugby league um, lifestyle and you know how how hard it is you know once your career is finished I guess that you have to go into that sort of world. Yeah I think you're right it's a um, funny enough I went to an event last night a networking event for current athletes and ex-athletes and it's basically a program that's trying to get kicked off in Brisbane through some Brisbane people that I know, one's my cousin and it's basically trying to educate the current crop and also give connections for ex-athletes um, to the corporate world and, and make it less daunting and, and let them know that and prepare for what's out there and so that when they are, when footy does finish, because it always does finish for everyone, you can't play forever. Yep. Um, They've got the skills and they also, it's not a daunting daunting task or they know where they want to go and they've created those relationships that can benefit them. So sort of yeah. interesting time in the talking about this now as I was just talking about it last night. <laughs> um, yeah, on that sort of stuff, does the, the footy clubs um, help you with that sort of stuff? Do they like help you get jobs um, and look after you like, post-career post into getting into the corporate world or is it just sort of... Uh, on your own, I, I, they do the they do the education pieces, and you know people will come in and talk to you in in the meeting rooms and things like that. Um, the footy world probably is biased to probably the top five percent of the players. You know, you, you know that you know the ones that are going to get jobs in media. You know the ones that are going to get the jobs within the footy teams and things like that. And then it's the other ninety five percent that don't fall by the wayside because you know. Might be 75% of those guys have a plan, have a career, are studying, have a trade, have an apprentice, but when it's that, that other 15% that you're missing out on, um, that you know, do need that education. Like I said, the NRL and the clubs do get people out to talk, but I'll admit when I was younger, I uh, someone would come in and be an ex-player or things like that. You've just finished your field session, you've got an hour and a half off before waves. And you're just listening to an next player and you sort of put your head down and don't listen and don't appreciate that you will be in this position. So yeah. I think it's it's the way that it, it can be done may be a little bit different in the sense that you need to be put in an environment that the players feel more comfortable and they're more engaged in, as opposed to a thing getting a message and saying, oh, there'll be a lecture today at, at 11 o'clock in the team meeting or type, type thing. So that's what this program is sort of going to try and help out and tailor with. So, Hopefully, if it gets off the ground, it's something that the RLPA and everyone will listen to. Yeah, well, that, that, that'd be great, you know, and it would help so many young players um, these days who, um, you know, throw them straight into the, into the deep end and they don't know the real world 
once you know your career's over and they don't they don't understand that yet. Yeah. Right. Um, just uh, talking about um, just want to talk about your your history your fa- your family history at the Broncos, mate. Um, yeah, you know, I was reading up that your grandfather was one of the co-founders of the Broncos. Yep. Uh, Dad played uh, played there, and your mother was an assistant to um, Wayne Bennett. Um, how did you sort of deal with the pressures of the family environment being around that club and um, all that sort of stuff growing up? At probably at a young age, you don't realise that there's any pressures because you know, as young kids, dude, I was playing every sport under the sun, so it was never a foregone conclusion that I was going to choose rugby league. And I think if you ask my granddad, he would prefer me to choose cricket anyway. So <laughs> it's, um, I never had pressure from my family. You know, at the end of the day, the media will make sto- not make stories up, but they'll create a story and things like that, which there may be added pressure on top of that, but I think it's the way that you handle yourself without drowning that out. Um, as opposed to pressure, there's probably a sense of pride and, you know, you want to sort of keep that legacy going. Um, my, my main goal was that I wanted to play more games for the club than my dad, so I got there, so I was pretty happy with that. But um, when it comes to pressure, mate, I guess being around the club from a young age, I used to go there after school, do my homework there and things like that. It was something that was so familiar with me. So yeah. when I did eventually finish school and got to sign and things like that, a lot of the staff members I knew and I knew from a young age. So um, obviously going to two other clubs, when I was daunting going to a club on the first day and, and not knowing anyone, you know, you might know the players, but it's still, you know, you've got to meet new coaching staff. So I think I was probably in good stead there and, and was lucky the fact that I did know the familiar faces and then many, so... I could create that sort of connection straight away. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, I know of. I've, I've talked to a couple of people that have had uh, similar sort of pressures, like um, you know, and it's it's very similar. You know, they sort of have been around the clubs and all that sort of stuff from a young age, so they are able to deal with it. Um, when you made your debut, you made your debut against the Roosters. Um, do you remember that week leading up to your debut? Like, did you? Was it a last minute call up or what did you sort of know during the week? Um, no, I knew because the week before I got flown down to Melbourne and I was 18th man because it was due, uh, during the origin period. So I wanted to get me down the week before and just, you know, see what it's like to travel with the team, learn, learn the warm up and things like that. So I was lucky enough. Um, and, and I can remember the week pretty vividly because the call I got from Hook, I missed. I was at a mate's house who had a terrible reception and I missed the call and I was like, oh, girl, here we go. And then, anyway, the week progressed. He gave me the news and the week progressed and then on the team run, or maybe it was the day before team run, I actually got hooked from training off the wing for whatever reason. It was, you know, my mind just wasn't there and things like that. So it was a pretty bumpy, bumpy week. But, yeah, the game I can remember it was raining pretty heavily and, our know, family were able to come down. It was a Sunday, Sunday night or Sunday afternoon game in Sydney, which is pretty rare to get for a Bronx yep. Roosters game. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I'll probably remember forever. And then there's also the, I guess, the comical value throughout the week that was that made it <laughs> more special. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how proud were your parents and um, your family um, for you to debut for the Broncos? Yeah, mum was very proud. I, I, I assume she was. Um, <laughs> um, mum doesn't really, she does tell me now that she's proud of me, but I think she's more proud of, of what I'm doing outside of what I did with my football career. I mean, she was the key driver in trying to keep me grounded. Yeah. Um, but you knew there was something there. And obviously, granddad was um, was quite proud as well. And then my cousin, who was sort of like a brother as well, he, he got to travel down to Sydney. So, it was, it was a special moment. They got to come downstairs into the change rooms after. So, again, mum gets pretty shy and embarrassed. So she was only there for a little bit and then granddad was in there telling telling everyone about what it was like in 1989. So <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was a good moment for the family and it's, it's something that obviously I hold close to my heart, the fact that they're able to travel down and the club helped them out in that respect. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. Absolutely. Um, just, you know, when you um, left Brisbane, you went to the Queensland Reds. Was there any any reason behind it? I know you played uh, Union as a kid, and you were saying before you played, you know, 
uh, heaps of sports, but was there a specific reason why you went across to Union? Um, coming from a Union school, there was um, always that bit of desire in, you know, in the back of my mind that I, I did want to go back to Union and play it because I guess it's hard to spend well, I was grade six to grade 12 at a, at a Union school playing with the same guys year in, year out. Um, I'll, I had a lot of, I know a lot of friends, but I had a few friends that transitioned from school as well that were playing professionally in rugby union. So obviously I kept in contact with them. I had a lot of other friends through the school system that were at the Reds at the time. And yep. they'd come and ask, they asked me the year before if I wanted to come, but they had another year on my contract. And I, didn't, I didn't want to break my contract because, yeah, loyalty, I could be loyal to a fault that time. Yep. And, you know, I, I don't I don't enjoy seeing people break their contracts. I understand it's a business and I also understand that both sides break contracts. So there's no one side that's at fault. But you know, I said thanks very much for the offer, but now I'm gonna stick it out for another year. And then I was lucky enough for them to come and ask me again if I wanted to come over for the two years. Nick Styles, who coached me when I was at school as well, was the coach at the time. Um, had a few good meetings with them. So I just felt like it was at that time in my life where I was ready for a change. Again, hindsight, you ask a lot of people, it was a wrong decision, but it's got to where I am today. So um, it's, in my mind, it was the wrong decision. Yeah. I don't think, like, for me personally, I don't think there's any right or wrong decisions when it comes to that sort of stuff. You know, you you played professionally at the NRL top level, you jump across to Union, and you still play professionally at the top level for Union. So, you know, whether you only played one or 150 games, it doesn't matter. You still made that that top grade and that top uh, represented the Queensland Reds. So, you know, I don't think I don't see it as a failure. Me personally, it might not have worked out the way you wanted yourself, but you tell know, everyone else um, that it's not. sorry, you can tell everyone else it wasn't a failure as well, though. <laughs> that's it, mate. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll defend anyone that sort of does that sort of stuff. It's it's that's how I see it. It's you know you. You go and play the top professional of any level of any sport, you know, and then you go switch into another one and you're able to make your debut for the top level. I mean, that's a hard transition. You know, going from league to union, I mean, I've done it at club level um, in Perth here and it's it's hard when you – just even the way you carry the ball, for example, is different in union to it is in league. And, um, you know, it's not an easy transition, but, you know, you had that background of playing union at school, so um, – just trying to get those little, I guess, little intricates of league out of you to play union would have been uh, hard, but yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah very good. No, I made lifelong friends at the club as well, so there's another added benefit. I think that's sort of flows through. What do you, you do to make lifelong friends? So. Yeah, definitely. Um, did you have it like a, a sort of a low point, uh, maybe a, a depression or something that you went through? Um, through your life, um, you know, it might not have been to do with football, but, you know, because, you know, obviously mental illness is a big thing these days. Um, you know, and if so, how did you sort of get through it? Yeah, oh, look, you're right, mental health is a um, serious thing. Mate, probably the thing that got to me the most was the commentary that you come on social media. Uh, I mean, you know, there's some pretty horrible stuff that gets put out there now and, I, I really feel for the guys that are on social media and the comments that get put out there. Anyone with a keyboard can say whatever they want and they don't realise that you know, at the end of the day that the human beings that they're talking about. A footy player's not going to go into an office and sit there and berate someone because they got something wrong. No one's perfect yeah. in any line of work that they do. So, yeah, mate, I probably really did struggle with that and probably an example of that is I think the last time I posted on social media might have been 27, 2018, when you, if you go look at my Instagram, you know, I've, I've long finished footy now and I have a life, I have a partner, I have a child, um, but I still don't want to post because there's a bit of sort of scars that are still attached that you just think, for whatever reason, someone's going to come out here and, and make a comment and it can unravel it again. So um, I try, I, I just, I, I hit a realisation that if you don't put it out there, people can't say things that will hurt you. So I've just sort yeah. of never, never, Posted again on social media, which you know it, it's a shame for for like life events, you know, having a son and things like that. You see, the general public are able to do that and it can be celebrated. But I've, I've just chosen now to sort of live a, a bit of a private life in that sense to uh, avoid the hurt. Um, yeah, 
that yeah. your equity has a lot of you say mental health and there's suicides. I've had ex teammates at a par well, mid suicide that you know due through to through depression and it's probably something that's now starting to get the recognition and be spoken about actively and openly and, and getting the getting rid of that stigma that men can't talk. So it's um, yeah. You know, I would be, I'd be lying if I say that I'm, I'm a big advocate for it, but I'm out there in the public talking about it. But, you know, you get asked questions like this, you can probably see that I'm a little passionate about it. And, you know, I think it stems that for school programs these days, they're, you know, they're semi-professional programs at schools. I think that need to be, it needs to be drilled into school kids at a young age about the pressures that life can bring you if you are to go into that sporting world. But, and, and it's not even the sporting world, it's, it's it's the world in general that um, I don't know what it is about the Australian culture, but we, we have a real tall poppy syndrome. Um, we like to we like to cut every man, man down for any achievement that he gets. So it's something that needs to be spoken about at all ages, not just when you get to professional footy. Yeah, definitely, mate. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the NRL these days, mate. You know, um, they just brought in the Redcliffe Dolphins as a 17th team. You know, they're going to debut next year. Obviously, the NRL won't look at um, having an odd number of teams for too long. Um, what do you think Perth's chances are of having been the 18th team? Uh, it's hard, Mark, right? because you know you think of Perth and you think it's predominantly a probably a rugby union state with the Western Force over there, and I guess they've also had what, what was it? What was the Perth team? That they've Western had, Reds. They've had the Western Reds over there before, so that. You know, if someone comes out against it, they'll say, look, they've had their chance. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was at the Bronx, I actually did a, promote, did a promo for the Bronx. I was injured. We flew over there for Broncos members night or gala night. And I think they packed out a room. So there's obviously the appetite for the rugby league over there. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it more comes down to the NRL. If they, whatever, whatever state they then choose, whether it's WA or if they go back over to New Zealand, they need to have the full backing of the NRL to make sure that the NRL want them to succeed in the sense, you know, on the field will happen through recruitment, coaching and things like that. But commercially, that's where obviously the money comes from. So then yeah. the NRL will need to be sure that it's not just a two, three year team. It's something that they want to continue forever. So if they're willing to put their backing behind it, then, then it's great. I mean, I think what's the other what's the real other two options that spring to mind would be New Zealand or maybe the Central Coast. Yeah, well, see, so, like I've I've talked to a few people. Um, you know, I don't know if you've seen some of my stuff, but I've talked to probably about 30, 30 ex uh, players and a um, couple of the current ones. Um, and you know, the feeling is, especially from the older players, is that the, uh, they don't all won't go to the Central Coast because there's too many teams in New South Wales and Queensland as it is. Um, you know, so a lot of the people are thinking Perth, um, and they, their opinion is, you know, if we want to be a national game, you know, we need to start over here in Perth um, and move back across the you area know, South Australia with the Adelaide Rams um, before we go to New Zealand. Um, I mean, I've talked to Nigel Vungana, who used to work for uh, New Zealand Rugby League, and he said that a, 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 another New Zealand team won't work not straight away. They need to put out an, uh, the NRL needs to put in a lot of investment into it first um, to build that area up. But, you know, I guess, you know, we're just, um, you yeah, know, the onlookers and the NRL gets to make those decisions. But, you know, I, I try to help, like, get you guys like yourself and all that um, who would like to see your first team in, um, you know, and try to get the NRL to notice that. I mean... Seeing a WA team in there would be good because you're right, it is growing the game in a state that is, like I said, either rugby union or AFL. Um, probably not rugby union to an extent, but you see what the AFL have done, how they've been able to go into where are they now? WA, SA, um, Sydney, Victoria, and Queensland. Yeah. So they're really brought in. I think the way that the AFL conduct their business, you know, they're probably the pinnacle of an organisation and a committee within Australia. So, and I don't think there's any down, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with copying a winning formula. So you, you're right. If, if you can get into the States and, and get that bit of interest, I mean, 
probably the only the difficult thing is the time difference that it would create. But you know, if, yeah. if that's the only, if that's the only thing that with the TV right deals and things like that, that's the only issue. I'm sure yeah. you can be overcome by potentially if you're playing a home game in WA, you might have a buy the next week or things like that. Because you know, there are ways around these type of uh, logistical things. But like I yeah. said, the NRL need to know that it's for the long haul and it's not something that it's going to be just a trial. And if it doesn't work, oh, well, we tried. It. It's got to be something that, oh, well, it's not yeah. working. Well, we didn't need to do to fix it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, have you got, um, you know, you said you're a father yourself. Have you got any advice to that for these young kids coming up today that I guess want to aspire to being professional athletes? Um, you know, have you got any advice for them coming up? My advice is, and it's probably what I'm seeing in children these days, is they're pigeonholing themselves in one sport. Like they're putting their mind and going, all right, I'm going to be a cricketer. And then they're not going to play anything else. They're doing cricket all year round. I think it's in an integral part of children's development that they play as much sport. If they want to play sport, you know, you don't have to play sport. Obviously, yeah. in my mind, it doesn't make sense why you don't want to play sport. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm the same, mate. I'm the same. Yeah, but you know, I, I think the the skills that you learn in each different sport, eventually, they all translate into into the game that you choose. I mean, you know, you play cricket, you work on your catching, that's going to help your football. Um, just everything like that, you know, it, it, all the skills can flow through. So that's probably my biggest piece of advice. Um, but I think that also needs to be led by the, the schooling systems that are now turning these programs into um, semi-professional programs. I was lucky enough to go when I was at school in the GPS system. I don't know, I'm not too sure if you know it well, but there was a, um, a lot of scholarships used to get handed out to kids, yeah. um, which sort of skewed, skewed the competition where if you had scholarships, you'd probably bring them better kids. Yeah. My school didn't give out scholarships at the time. It changed that, but without being on scholarship, I wasn't held to what the school's expectations were of me. You know, yeah. I, I had a rugby union, and this was the example. I used to, we used to have first 15 rugby union training on a Monday afternoon, but I had Broncos Academy. If I'm on a scholarship, the rugby union school is saying, no, you can't go to that academy, but not being on scholarship, I was able to go out and do, do my rugby league as well. Yeah. At the end of the day, my coach sat there and um, said, it's not like you're going home and just sitting at home. You're actually still training and, and developing skills. So yeah, you know, I think I think there needs to be an emphasis on doing multiple sports. And you yeah. know, it could be you do multiple sports to a great team, then you focus, but at least you've got that base of the skills that are coming through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I I do the same. I mean, I'm a father of uh 12 kids. I've got um, 10 that live in the house. Yeah. <laughs> busy. Yeah, just just a bit. Um, you know, so with my kids, I, I try to get them to do all different sports. Um, you know, I don't, um, I, I did different sports as a kid. I played um, soccer, AFL, league, union, cricket, um, swimming, all that sort of stuff. So, and each sport helped the other one, you know, for me to develop it, you know. So I try to get these kids to, uh, my kids to, yeah, play different sports. Um, you know, my boys are playing netball this year um, as well as playing league. So they Saturdays and Sundays, they're playing um, netball and then uh, rugby league. So it helps their hand-eye coordination there. You know, and, they, and also their, their team bonding. Um, you know, and that's, that's a big thing for me is I want my kids to be playing sports because it helps, um, yeah, the team bonding. Because you can't do things in life if you're not part of a team. Um, you know, it's very hard. Probably in that, and then it then translates to your, to your life after footy as well. Um, yep. The friendship you make in those other sports, for example, at that networking event, a bloke walked in the door and it was a bloke that I played cricket with when I was 15, 16 years old, and we could sit there and speak for an hour about what's happened since. <laughs> what's happened yep. 15 years ago? It, it's just something that sport can bring people together in, in a way that not much, not many other things can. So it's a very, um, very unique thing, but you know, I I've thought about my child when he's going to play sports and what I would want to do with him first. And my first thing is I want to put put him in the soccer. I mean, yeah. 20, 20 years ago, you say you want to put your kid in the soccer, people think oh, it'll be soft and things like that. But the skills yeah. that 
that those guys can do with their feet and, and the way that you kick a ball. Yeah. It's very, it's very special. And you know, if they can learn that at a young age, that's going to then take them through to AFL footy or, you know. Yeah. yeah. You ask my partner, she'd probably say, oh, I don't know how that's going to correlate to his studies, but anyway. <laughs> through, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, see, my dad did the same thing for me. He put me into soccer first. I mean, yeah. he was a rugby league nut. Yeah, we grew up, in, I grew up in Brisbane. Um, and he put me into soccer first. Um, you know, and everyone was asking, why, why are you doing that? Um, you know, he wants to play league. Um, and he goes, yeah, it's going to develop his foot skills. So when he's able to take it out into the rugby league field, you know, he's able to kick the ball better. He knows, you know, he's different different angles to kick the ball at and this and that and um, you're, you're sidestepping and whatever else but yeah it's all the foot skills that I learned from soccer I was able to transition over to rugby league um, just the last thing mate I know you're busy I know you're at work at the moment but um, yeah what are you doing what are you up to these days um, are you have, do you own your own business uh, what, what are you doing oh, my business. I wish I own my business okay <laughs> um, no, no, that's, I work in um, for a construction group called BMD Construction. Um, BMD Group, they're a national, actually, they're an international company. We've done that in the Philippines. Um, yeah. Basically, we are a civil, civil construction company that have, they're a very diverse company as well. They, they go up and have different sort of ranges of the company, which is, you know, something good because it's not just one stop shop. There's a lot of, a lot of different avenues and progression for that company. Um, they're a sports mad company. They actually sponsor the Lions, they sponsor the Cowboys. I think they've no, no. I think they're sponsored maybe the Origin. They've got something to do with the Origin. So yeah, you know, I'm easily able to talk to things. When I I can't talk to construction that well, but I can talk to footy if someone wants to come talk about it. But um, I've been here since I retired um, in 2019. So coming on what two and a half years now so it, it's a company that I didn't know much about I didn't know much about the role I actually had to search what the um, job title meant when I, when I was going for the union it, it was lucky the market came through a football introduction um, they sponsored the women and sea girls as well where, where a women I was going to try and play but COVID shut that down um, yeah and you know it's, it's probably a company that I, I do liken to a football they're a family owned company um, They've got a lot of values that football teams have as well in the sense of loyalty, um, turn and family, being collaborative. So, again, it's something that, like I, I guess, probably ran back right at the start of the conversation. I, um, I didn't realise that the skills that you learn in footy translate into a business like this. So it's a business that, as we touch wood, that they'll have me forever and I'll stay forever. So. Yes, the way. That sense. That's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so have you got um, just the one child, have you, mate? Got one child at the moment. And, um, he's got engaged, so that was sort of been put on me. A lot of heat been put on me the last two years about that. So just finally took the plunge. So obviously got plans for a, a big family moving forward. Yeah. Got to get married first. I've seen a few quotes for a few wedding venues, so I'm trying to wonder that's what I need to do. More with my right arm to try and get a... To get a wedding venue these days. So, yeah, mate, it's, it's a very exciting time for, for me personally and professionally. So, everything's going well. Just going back to my old school, I'm going to do some coaching there as well. Um, having two years off footy, I, I wanted to have that time away from footy because I wanted to disconnect myself from footy. So, that you know, I've seen players hang around probably a bit too long and, and then they're caught at the end when, when the team really let go of them. Uh, they're caught with the, what I want to do. So disconnecting myself, but I felt like it was a good time to go back and you know, my son's enrolled at the school that I went to, so if I can go do some coaching, it, you know, it's just one of those things that you want to try to give back to being an old boy. That's it, yeah, mate. Um, beautiful, mate. Um, like I said, I know you're a busy man, um, so I'll let you get back to doing your work. Um, Lachlan Marenta, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. All right, thanks, mate. Have a good day. You too, bud. Bye.